He was Kenya's first attorney general. Other than the country's presidents, he was by far the most powerful man in public life. Towards the end of the rule of Kenya's first president, Jomo Kenyatta, he played a critical role in ensuring that Kenyatta's long-serving vice president, Daniel Arab Moy, was the one who succeeded to the presidency when Kenyatta died. And during President Moy's first five years, he would call most of the shots that mattered in politics, in the process, making and breaking many careers. Charles Mugane Njonjo was born in 1920 at Kikuyu in Kiambu district of Central Province. His father, Josiah Njonjo, a senior chief in the colonial administration of Kenya, sent Njonjo to Kikuyu Primary School, and then in 1937 to nearby Alliance High School, then the leading boarding secondary school for Kenyan Africans. In the same class with Njonjo at Alliance was Jeremiah Nyaga, who would go on to become the longest serving cabinet minister in independent Kenya. Upon successfully completing his studies at Alliance in 1941, Njonjo joined King's College Budo in Uganda, from which he proceeded to Fort Hare University in South Africa, where he studied law. In 1946, Njonjo left South Africa for Exeter University, England, for postgraduate studies in public administration. Between 1947 and 1950, Njonjo studied at the London School of Economics. While at the LSE, he served as chairman of the East African Students' Union, whose literary secretary at the time was Fitz de Souza, a Kenyan of Goan descent who would later become the first deputy speaker of independent Kenya's parliament. Njonjo spent the next four years studying law and in 1954 was admitted as a barrister at law to Gray's Inn in London, one of the most prestigious inns of law in England. Njonjo returned to Kenya the following year, joined the colonial government service as a registrar and quickly rose through the ranks to become a registrar general. As Kenya's independence drew near, promotions for Njonjo would come in a flurry. In 1961, he was made senior crown counsel. The following year, he became deputy public prosecutor. Upon Kenya attaining self-rule from Britain on June 1, 1963, Njonjo was appointed Attorney General by Jomo Kenyatta, who had become the country's first Prime Minister after the Kenya African National Union KANU, of which he was President, had won the last general election, before the country became independent six months later on December 12th. At independence, Kenya was governed by a majimbo or federal-type constitution through which the central government shared some powers with the country's regions, an arrangement that Kenyatta and Kanu had agreed to only in order to avoid delaying Kenya's independence. Now that the country was free of British colonial rule, Kenyatta ordered Njonjo as Attorney General to draw up amendments to the constitution that would do away with the regional structure and make Kenya a republic. In the process of drawing up the constitutional amendments, Njonjo became very close to Kenyatta. And he also became close to Tom Boya, Kanu's powerful and Western-leaning Secretary General, whom Kenyatta had appointed Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs. Mboya's responsibility would be to push Njonjo's amendments through Parliament, for Njonjo, not being an MP, could not himself argue his case in Parliament. Mboya not only got the new constitutional amendments adopted by Parliament, but in the process convinced the opposition parties, the Kenya African Democratic Union, KADU, and the African People's Party, APP, to wind up and have their members join KANU, thus turning Kenya into a de facto one-party state. Under the new Republican constitution that took effect on December 12, 1964, Kenyatta became Kenya's first president. Under the new constitutional provisions, there would also be a vice president, an office that appeared to have been created to accommodate as well as contain Kanu's left-leaning vice president, Oginga Odinga. For by then, the country's leadership was split along ideological lines. On the right, there was Mboya's conservative western-leaning camp. On the left was Odinga's camp, which was allied to the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. In the middle was Kenyatta, who was suspicious of both camps. The key leaders in Kenyatta's camp were Njonjo, Kenyatta's brother-in-law and Minister of State in the office of the President, Peter Mbiukoinange, and Kenyatta's personal physician and Minister for Defence, Jorogi Mungai. 
The triumvirate was sometimes referred to as the Kiambu group on account of the fact that, like Kenyatta, they all came from Kiambu. Njonjo's constitutional amendments called for a vice president who was mostly ceremonial. He would be appointed by the president, not elected by the people. He would serve at the pleasure of the president. And he would not automatically succeed the president in the event of the latter's death or resignation. But Njonjo had also included in his constitutional amendments provisions that made the attorney general an ex officio member of both parliament and the cabinet. This dual role ended up giving Jonjo direct access to the decision-making machinery of all three branches of the government, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary, for which he was the chief law official. It would soon form the basis for Jonjo's future political power. Jonjo's first major intervention in Kenya's politics was as one of Kenyatta's key lieutenants in the war against Odinga's left-leaning camp. Working behind the scenes in tandem with Mboya, Odinga's main adversary in Kanu, Jonjo contributed much to Odinga's eventual exit from Kanu in 1966. When Odinga took up the leadership of a new party, the Kenya People's Union, KPU, and it looked as if many Kanu MPs would quit the ruling party and join the KPU, Jonjo and Mboya quickly moved to neutralize him. They had Parliament pass a constitutional amendment bill that required all who had defected from Kanu to seek a fresh man from the electorate. The result was the little general election of June 1966 that saw many of Odinga's allies lose their parliamentary seats. But relations between Jonjo and Boya would not remain cordial for long. With Odinga more or less taken care of, Kenyatta's next focus was Mboya, who had become even more powerful within Kano since the little general election. Again, Jonjo would be at the forefront of Kenyatta's strategy to neutralize Mboya. Except that Jonjo would now work behind the scenes in tandem with Koinange, Mungai, and some former Kadu leaders, particularly Daniel Arab Moy, who had been appointed vice president after Joseph Murumbi, Odinga's successor, resigned from the post in 1966. It was Njonjo and Moy who in March 1968 tried to amend the constitution in such a way as to bar Mboya from succeeding Kenyatta, who was then showing signs of ill health. Their intended amendment sought to raise the minimum age for a president from 35 to 40 years. Njonjo and his allies thought Mboya, who was then 35, had presidential ambitions and might mesmerize parliament into letting him succeed Kenyatta in the event of the latter's death. Njonjo's amendment was rejected by parliament, but that did not stop the onslaught on Mboya. And the proposed amendment marked the beginning of a close working political relationship between Njonjo and Moy. Mboya was eventually taken care of by other means by someone else. On July 5th, 1969, an assassin's bullet ended his life as he walked out of a pharmacy on Government Road, today's Moy Avenue, Nairobi. His death led to tension between the Kikuyu and Mboya's and Odinga's community, the Luo. In October that year, when Kenyatta visited Kisumu, he was heckled by an angry Luo crowd who threw stones at his motorcade as he left the town. Kenyatta's guards responded by firing into the crowd, killing and wounding scores of people. A few days later, Odinga and several of his colleagues in the KPU were detained. The party itself was banned. With Odinga and Boya out of the way, Kenyatta and his Kikuyu allies now exercised near absolute power in Kenya and Jonjo became the man Kenyatta depended upon to make that power appear legally legitimate as well as to judicially deal with any challenge to that power. It was a job that Jonjo was superbly qualified to do. During Kenya's first decade of independence, the country's judiciary was predominantly non-African, the senior most judges and magistrates being of British and Asian descent. Many of them were on secondment from Britain and were at Njonjo's mercy when it came to renewal of their contracts, for as Attorney General, Njonjo was principal advisor to the government on all legal and judicial matters. Most of his friends and senior people working for him at the Attorney General's chambers were British. His wife, 
Margaret Bryson, whom he married in 1972 and with whom he would later have three children, two daughters and a son, was originally British. Njonjo would use his power over the judiciary to maximum effect to ensure that anti-government politicians were kept in check. Nakuru Town MP Mark Muithaga found this out in 1975 after he brought a motion to Parliament calling for the setting up of a select parliamentary committee to probe the murder of Nyandarua North MP Josiah Mwangi Karyuki in March that year. The select committee was established and ended up pointing fingers at high-ranking people in Kenyatta's government, including Koinange, for the murder or subsequent cover-up. In October, a few months after the committee's report, Muisaga was hauled to a Nakuru court and eventually jailed on a charge of having assaulted his wife, Njeri. The alleged offence had been committed nearly two years earlier, but Njonjo's office had until then overlooked it. That same month, two MPs, Martin Shikuku of Butere and Jean-Marie Serronet of Tinderet, who also happened to be the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, were picked up by plainclothes policemen from the precincts of Parliament and detained under the Preventive Detention Act that Njonjo had earlier got Parliament to adopt. Their offence was that while contributing to parliamentary debate, they had accused Kenyatta's government of trying to kill Parliament the way they claimed it had killed the ruling party, Kano. A few days later, Njonjo warned parliamentarians that they could enjoy parliamentary immunity, guaranteed them by Parliament's Powers and Privileges Act, only if they spoke responsibly. Those who did not heed Njonjo's warning would later find themselves in trouble. People at that time felt that these criticisms, these demonstrations, these utterances, these writing in the press is delaying us, is distracting us, is ob obstruction. They are, we, we, are, we want to move forward, but they, they, these, these people are delaying us. And that's why you had uh, people who were unfortunately delayed, and it was most unpleasant, but. Uh, at that time, uh, those who are in authority felt that it's right thing. Two such MPs were Elderet North MP Philomena Chelagat Mutai and Kitutu East MP George Anyona. Mutai and Anyona were the only MPs who opposed a constitution amendment bill that Njonjo brought before Parliament in December 1975, seeking to give the President the power to forgive anyone found guilty of an election offence. In February the following year, Mutai was arrested and hauled to court on a charge of inciting some of her constituents to destroy property on an Asian-owned private farm in Wasingishu. Mutai was found guilty and was sentenced to two and a half years in jail. The only voice raised in Parliament against her jailing was that of George Anyona. Anyona himself would get into trouble when in April the following year, he tabled documents in Parliament alleging malpractices in the awards of tenders for the supply of wagons and locomotives to the state-owned Kenya Railways Corporation. Anyona charged that Njonjo, the Minister for Transport and Communications, Isaac Omolo Okero, the former Minister for Agriculture, Bruce McKenzie, and the British High Commissioner to Kenya, Stanley Fingland, were involved in the malpractices. Anyona was said to be planning to follow up his charges with a motion calling on Parliament to set up a probe committee to investigate the matter. He never got to do so. On May 4th, 1977, Anyona was arrested while within the precincts of Parliament. And like Serone and Shikuku, he would later end up in detention. By that time, it was evident to those close to Kenyatta that he was ailing. For nearly a year, he had not been very active in public. On many occasions, it was Njonjo who issued statements committing Kenyatta and the government to important policy stances. Such was the case during the SAR relations between Kenya and Tanzania that preceded the collapse of the East African community in 1977. It was Njonjo, rather than the Foreign Minister Munyo Wayaki or the Minister for East African Cooperation, Robert Ouko, who articulated most forcefully Kenya's hard-line stance towards Tanzania. 
When the community finally collapsed in June that year, Njonjo would be seen as the man on the Kenyan side who killed the community. Indeed, by then, Njonjo had assumed the role of chief spokesman for Kenyatta's government, especially on matters of security. And in September 1977, he dismissed a plea by Kilifi South MP Maurice Mboja to have political detainees released and the Public Security Act repealed. Njonjo said that those in detention would be released only when the national security situation permitted it. People were impatient. The authorities then were, was impatient. The government then was impatient. They had no time no, to enjoy all this freedom that you have. You people in the press want to tell us what we do and the delay, what we want to do. And therefore those who were against what the government was trying to do and therefore they felt that this is delaying our action because they were detained. I'm not defending the detention but it was done and sometimes I feel that uh, we should have strong arm to control some of the things that, uh, that, that we do. Njonjo's political clout was at its mightiest when in June 1976, a group allied to the Gikuyu, Embu and Meru Association, Gemma, had embarked on a campaign to amend the country's constitution in such a manner as to ensure that Vice President Moy did not succeed Kenyatta in the event of Kenyatta dying in office. The so-called Change the Constitution group was led by Gemma chairman James Njenga Karume. Gemma National Organizing Secretary and Nakuru North MP Dixon Kihika Kimani, former Foreign Affairs Minister Joro Gemungai, and three cabinet ministers Paul Ngay, Jackson Angaine, and James Kishuru. All of them were close to Kenyatta, and after their first public meeting in Nakuru, as part of a nationwide campaign to sell their Change the Constitution idea, it seemed that they had Kenyatta's backing. But Njonjo soon put spokes in their wheels. We had people who, who were going around the country saying that the president, Kenyatta, was dying. He was sick. And uh, they started having meetings in Nairobi, in Akuru. The next one, when I really got, got angry about it, they were going to hold it in Meru. And the president was in Nakuru. And uh, then I told the president, this is what is happening, are you sick, is it, uh, I mean, have you talked something that, that you are dying and you, you don't tell me? That is when he himself realized that there was something afoot. And the whole thing was to gear people so that Moi does not succeed Kenyatta. Well, I couldn't be associated with a move like that. In September, he warned them that it was an offence, punishable by death on conviction, to contemplate the president's death. The group tried to call the bluff on him, claiming that he was using his constitutional office to advance a personal political agenda. But they would later concede defeat after Kenyatta himself upheld Njonjo's stand during a full cabinet meeting held at State House Nakuru, but not attended by Njonjo. Njonjo had obviously broken ranks with his erstwhile colleague in the Kiambu group, Mungai, and his Gemma allies, and had now teamed up with Moi. The battle over who would succeed Kenyatta would nevertheless continue, only that it now shifted to who amongst the protagonists, the pro-Moi or the Change the Constitution camp, ended up controlling the ruling party Kanu after its national elections that were due to be held in April 1977. Njonjo became intimately involved, albeit behind the scenes, in the strategy that the Moy camp drew up to win the party elections. And the more Njonjo got involved in party affairs, the more his power was felt everywhere else on the political scene. Few people had the courage to take him on. One exception was Foreign Affairs Minister Munyo Awayaki. On August 8, 1978, Njonjo caused a major diplomatic storm when he suggested that Kenya and other African countries should end their hypocrisy over sanctions against apartheid South Africa and instead enter into a dialogue with Pretoria. 
He made the remarks in Nairobi while playing host to renowned South African heart surgeon Christian Barnard. Wayaki was the only one who publicly repudiated Njonjo's views. He accused Njonjo of interfering in the work of his ministry and charged that Njonjo's careless remarks threatened Kenya's unity. Wayaki threatened to resign if Kenyatta ordered that Kenya open dialogue with Pretoria. Kenyatta died two weeks later on August 22nd without saying anything about the row between his two senior cabinet members or, for that matter, about the more important Kanu party elections that had been postponed indefinitely the previous year. Those elections were in fact not held until October 1978, after Moy had succeeded to the presidency in accordance with the constitution. If you want to change the constitution so that Moy does not succeed whoever it is they wanted, come to parliament, introduce a motion, and uh, if we pass it, fine. If, you, if we, you, you fail, you have failed and you close your mouth forever. And that's what I said as the position I took and I, I believe quite strongly that if I didn't do that, we would have had chaos in this country. On October 10th, 1978, Kano Secretary General Robert Matano proposed and Party National Organizing Secretary Nathan Monoko seconded the nomination of Moy as the party's sole candidate for the presidential by-election occasioned by Kenyatta's death. It was Njonjo who declared Moy the second president of the Republic of Kenya. Under Moy's rule, at least during the first few years, Njonjo would be even more powerful than he had been under Kenyatta's.